The medieval drama had been an amateur production presented by the clergy or members of the various trade guilds. The performers were not professional actors, but ordinary citizens who acted only in their spare time. In the 16th century, the Elizabethan stage became almost wholly professional and public. Professional groups were formed, and audiences had to pay a ticket to watch their performances. The actors, usually young males, organized themselves into companies. Each actor owned a share of the company. The company would lease or build its own theater in which to perform, hire men to play the minor parts, and get young apprentice boys to play the female parts in the plays. The first regular theatre was constructed in 1576 by James Burbage and was called the Theatre. In the next 30 years, eight new theatres were built around London. The Curtain, the Rose, the Swan, the Globe, which is Shakespeare's theatre, the Fortune and the Red Bull. The Globe was octagonal in shape with a platform extending to the centre of the theatre. The stage had an inner stage which was used for special scenes. There was also a trapdoor in the platform which was used for the sudden appearance of ghosts and spectres. Most of the action of a play would take place on this platform. The Elizabethan theatre was an intimate theatre since the actor was generally very close to the audience. This close physical proximity provided for the maximum communication. The spectators were not only sitting in front of the stage, but on the three sides as well. After the Reformation, Mysteries and moralities lost all their influence on the audience. They were rather disliked by the people because of their link and association with all church. In response to public demand came the interlude with its fun and frolics and the masks with their costume displays gorgeous colors. Comedy captured the mind of the English people. But everything was in a chaotic and formless state before the advent of the university wits, the greatest among whom was Marlowe. It was in the 15th century that tragedy originated in English drama, and this was due to the influence of the translation of great Latin tragedies of Seneca. In fact, Italian Renaissance had a tremendous influence upon the development of the English drama. Most of the Senecan characteristics, long speeches, lack of action, ghosts and horrible scenes of murders were very much there. Tragedies had Senecan characteristics. The first great thing done by Christopher Marlowe was to break away from the medieval conception of tragedy. In medieval drama, tragedy was a thing of the princess only. It dealt with the rise and fall of kings or royal personalities. But it was left to Marlowe to evolve and create the real tragic hero. Almost all the heroes of Marlowe, Tamerlane, Faustus, or the Jew of Malta, are of humble origins, but they have great heroic qualities and they are really great men. His tragedy is in fact the tragedy of one man, the rise, fall and death of the hero. Incidents of the drama revolve around the hero. His heroes are men fired with passion and ambition. His Tamerlane wants to gain military and political power. His Faustus sells his soul to the devil to get ultimate power through knowledge. But what Marlowe really depicts and dramatizes is that all his heroes with all their aspirations 
find that the flush of their temporary success leads to their tragic and terrible end. Here lies the greatness of Marlowe. Marlowe's heroes are dominated by some ambition or passion, a supreme greed for power, wealth or knowledge. In this, we may trace the distinct influence of Niccolò Machiavelli on Marlowe. Marlowe must have read Il Principe and derived this idea of ambition from him. In his book, Machiavelli praised ambition as the only desirable virtue in a prince and denied all morality except that morality which operated for the good of the individual and, once they attained the power, the highest good of the state. Thus we find all his heroes dominated by ambition, going beyond all moral codes and willing to do anything to achieve their end. Such intense passion and struggle with superhuman energy to achieve their end makes Marlowe's tragic heroes great indeed and adds glory and grandeur to their personality. Thus Marlowe discarded the old conception of tragedy as descent from greatness to misery and replaced it by the greatness of individual struggle. His heroes believe that the earthly gain and glory are the highest goal of all. They embody the true Renaissance outlook. Another great achievement of Marlowe was to introduce the element of conflict, especially in a struggle in his greatest tragedy, Dr. Faustus. The spiritual or moral conflict takes place in the heart of man. A great tragedy reveals the emotional conflict or moral agony of the mighty hero. In this respect, Dr. Faustus may be reckoned as the first great spiritual tragedy or tragedy of the soul. Like the heroes of ancient Greek tragedy, Marlowe's heroes are not helpless puppets in the hands of blind fate. The final scene of the play consists of a long soliloquy from Faustus and is the climax of his pact with the devil. He now faces damnation and eternal punishment. Time. After 24 years of unlimited knowledge and power over nature, here is the last hour of Faustus' life. The speed of time passing is psychological rather than realistic. The effect is intensified by the time check when the watch strikes, marking the passing of the first half hour and when the clock strikes midnight. Stopping time. In his fear, 
Faustus hopes to be able to exert some power over the whole universe so as to slow time down or to stop it, but finds that this is hopeless. The passing of time is in the natural order of things in which Faustus cannot intervene. The Limits of Suffering Time as perpetuity is also evoked in the final scene, the endless punishment that Faustus will suffer in hell. He begs for some remission of this agony. Blood The redempting power of Christ's blood is also recalled in this scene, recalling the blasphemous use of blood when Faustus signs his name in blood on his agreement with Mephistopheles. Pain Throughout the scene, Marlow creates a strong sense of Faustus spiritual suffering, which is often expressed as physical suffering. His body has become the battleground for his soul, and Lucifer will allow him no means of escape. Dissolution and non-being Metempsychosis is a theory of the soul derived from the teachings of Pythagoras, who may have based his ideas on the Indian concept of reincarnation. Faustus longs for his body, his very self, to be in some way dissolved in order to escape damnation. I'll burn my books. Faustus' last words are, I'll burn my books. Books have represented both the highest and the lowest points in Faustus' life. It was usual for magicians who wished to renounce their art to prove their sincerity by disposing of their books. This is even true of a mainly good magician like Prospero, in Shakespeare's play The Tempest, when he promises, I'll drown my book.